Welcome back to the first lesson of the last unit, combining functions. Uh, we've come a long way since the beginning of the course. We've actually come a long way since like grade nine, learning about functions kind of for the first time, even though we didn't call them functions back then. We called them linear relations and quadratic relations in grade 10. And then in 11, we introduced the function notation. However, at this point, we've learned quite a bit. We've learned about uh, polynomial functions, including linear, quadratic, cubic, and so on. We've learned about rational functions. We've done uh, trigonometric functions. We've done exponential functions. We've done logarithmic functions. We, we've done a lot of functions. And we've been able to solve a lot of problems in various ways using different modeling techniques or different sets. Um, now we're gonna talk about putting those together so we can solve even more problems. Specifically, today's lesson will be on the sums and differences of functions. And the fantastic news about this is it's about as easy as adding and subtracting is. And frankly, it's something you've done since about grade 10 or 11 anyway. We just never really identified it as such. So this is a good starting point for our introduction to combining functions. That said, let's jump into the lesson. Okay, the first question we're going to take a look at, we've got some figures there with just little boxes in them, and uh, they have an interesting pattern. I'm not sure exactly what that is, uh, but we'd like to come up with an equation that represents the pattern that we're taking a look at there. So let's start by just throwing in the number of boxes in each of these figures. We'll start off with figure zero. Uh, I know a lot of books and some teachers start off with figure one, two, three, but it really doesn't take into account that we're going to have... Um, equations that have x values of 0, 1, 2, 3. So we'll start off with figure 0. Figure 0 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 boxes. Figure 2 has 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 boxes. Figure 3 has, I think, 20, or sorry, figure 2 has 23 boxes, I believe. Figure 3 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times, uh, I think 40 in total. And uh, there is no figure number four. Kind of like I screwed that one up. Or maybe we can figure out what figure number four is going to be um, once we see what the pattern is. Now, if I asked you to come up with an equation that models this pattern, um, I'll be honest, I would have a hard time doing that. But if we take things and break them into pieces, sometimes that helps. So let's see if this makes any difference. You know, uh, just put some different colors on different pieces. I'm going to make that one blue. I'm going to make these blue. I'm going to make these blue. And so on. And if you don't know why I'm doing this, um, well, hopefully we'll see in a moment. I'm going to make uh, these ones red. Again, it looks like I'm just kind of choosing randomly which ones I'm shading in. And I, well, I will say I kind of am, except that I'm kind of using a pattern that I think might make sense. I'll do some yellow ones here. And as I'm doing this, I want you to look at it again and see if you can see a pattern in these. Okay, I'm going to scroll up a little bit, and there's enough now that you can see a little hint that I gave there about shading. Uh, but let's do it this way. We have the blue, we have the red, and we have the yellow. First of all, what's the pattern in the blue? Uh, we go 2, 4, uh, 8, 16. Huh. I think that's going to be y equals 2x to the negative 1. 2 to the 0. Or actually just 2 to the, uh, sorry, plus 1. So that when we plug in 0, we get 2 to the 1, which is 2. That's how many blue ones we have in the 0 figure. Uh, when we plug in figure 1, 
2 to the 2 is 4. When we plug in figure 2, we get 2 to the 3 is 8, and then 2 to the 4 is 16. Okay, perfect. What about the um, red one? Uh, I start off with 1, and then 4, and then 9, and then 16. Well, that looks like perfect squares, 1, 4, 9, 16. Now it's going to be perfect squares of, of 1 bigger than that. So the 0th figure has 1 squared, the 1 figure has 2 squared, the 2 figure has 3 squared. So that's just going to be x plus 1 squared. And then the yellow goes 2, 4, 6, 8. So it looks like it's just 2 times uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 2 times x plus 1. And we can verify that that works by trying some of them. When I plug in 3 there, I get 8, and on my third diagram, yeah, I got 8. That, that seems to work. So that's the number of blue uh, boxes, red boxes, and yellow boxes, but the total number of boxes is actually going to be the sum of all three of those things. So y equals 2 to the x plus 1 plus x plus 1 squared plus 2 times x plus 1. And I think it's safe to say that um, that would be an extremely hard thing to figure out if we hadn't kind of shaded the boxes indifferently and seen the pattern broken down into its pieces. And that's often the case with composite functions. It is often very hard to see them, uh, see the patterns until things are broken down at least a little bit into their pieces. Um, I guess now we can kind of go back and figure out how many boxes there should be on our fourth one. If I just say at four, um, that would be two to the five is 32. And then we have 4 plus 1 squared would be 25 boxes. So we'd have 25 red ones. And then 2 times x plus 1, we'd have uh, 2 times 5 is 10. And we could have, again, figured that out for the pattern. We could have doubled this one since it's exponential. We could have done this part here, which is the square. And we could have done this one, which was linear. I guess I should actually say that this was exponential. It is times 2 each time, but... This part is exponential. So if we put all that together, I think we get out uh, 67 would be in our fourth pattern if we were to draw it. This is actually called something, uh, it's called the superposition principle. You may have heard of that, especially if you took physics and talk about waves at all. Uh, superposition principle just says that if you've got two separate things and you put them together, is literally just add them together and the results are the sum of the two things. So if one pattern has three and the other pattern has four, then putting them together gives a pattern of seven and so on. And we can actually do this with graphs as well. So here we have a graph, um, or we're given two functions, f at x equals x squared and g at x equals three, which is granted pretty boring. And if we add them together, uh, we get h at x. So now, um, if we take f at x plus g at x, we get x squared plus 3. I could actually do that right down here. It's literally just taking f at x and adding g at x. Well, that's easy. So what was a parabola, I'm going to actually just draw in the, change color there. I'm going to draw in the parabola. Oops, sorry. Scale on that's going up by twos. Uh, so we got one and one, four and four, nine and nine. So there's our parabola. And we've got uh, g and x is three. that we can basically add those together piecewise and say, when x is zero, I have zero plus three is three. Over here, I have one plus three is four. One plus three is four. Uh, three plus four is seven. 
same over there. And three plus uh, nine is 12, which is actually gonna take me just off the graph, but not so far that I can't estimate it. And sure enough, that is actually the parabola x squared plus three, exactly as we'd expect it to be, since moving a parabola up three isn't too tricky. Well, what about x squared plus two x? If we add the x squared from f at x and the two x from g at x, again, I'm just gonna graph those fairly quickly here. And the parabola is pretty straightforward. And the 2x is just, I, I know it's gonna look like it has a slope of one, but that's because it's uh, each box is actually two high and one wide. So there's my 2 at x. And then I go through and add point by point. So here, zero plus zero is zero. Over at x equals one, uh, I have one plus two should equal three. At two, I have uh, four and four, which should equal eight. And then at five, I think I'm well off the graph. Uh, at x equals negative one, I'm going to have uh, one and minus two should give me negative one. At negative two, I have minus four and plus four gives me zero. And uh, even though it's a little off the graph at uh, negative three, I'm gonna have minus six from the red and plus nine from the uh, yellow, so that'll give me plus three. And I get a graph that looks like this one. So that's literally just doing the superposition where I'm just adding up uh, pieces one at a time. I'm looking at different X values, adding the two X values from my individual uh, functions and putting them together into one function. And lo and behold, our answer does look like a parabola. However, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a weird looking parabola. Well, I shouldn't say weird looking, all parabolas are the same shape. It's been shifted over and down a little bit. So h at x equals uh, x squared plus two x. And I could leave my equation like that. And something that we really haven't done much of, or at all, I think, uh, is completing the square to, uh, to put that into vertex form. If you don't remember how to do this, don't worry too much about it. Um, but I'm gonna get a plus one minus one, and then this becomes x plus one squared minus one. And sure enough, that would be a parabola that's been shifted to the left one and down one, which is exactly what we see in our picture. Again, you don't need to put it into vertex form. We didn't talk about that too much. Uh, you did it in grade 11, but we didn't do it too much here. So uh, we'll skip the details on that. You could throw it to Desmos and verify it. I just wanted to show you that the equation actually is the parabola that we ended up graphing piece by piece. Question three a question based on an actual scenario that I had to deal with when I was, for some reason, briefly the staff sponsor that helped with some dance stuff. Um, you have seen me before, so I think you should highly question why I was involved in dance in any way, shape, or form, and you'd be right to do so. But the dance students are selling t-shirts to raise money for a dance competition, and they actually did. There is a fixed $200 setup charge for producing the t-shirts plus $5 per t-shirt made. The t-shirts will be sold for $8 each. Write an equation to represent the following. So we have the total cost C as a function of the number of shirts produced. So C at N. Well, the cost to produce the shirts is gonna be $200 plus $5 per shirt, so plus 5M. And although it may not seem like it, that actually is, well, it's a linear function, but it actually kind of is a composition of functions. It's a linear function and a constant. And we never had a problem dealing with it before. Uh, the revenue function, this is how much money is brought in. 
So the revenue at N is going to be 8 times N, $8 per shirt. Graph the functions and identify the point of intersection and explain the meaning of the coordinates. Okay, I am going to go do that in Desmos because there's not a lot of room there to do hand graph and hand graphing is so yesterday. We already did a little bit of it today, so that's good enough for us. Okay, so our equations, I'm going to try and use these variables again. I'm never sure if Desmos is going to take them. I think they've updated it since I started using it, so it may do it. Uh, let's center in there. Oh, okay, there's a linear equation, that works. And I'm gonna plot the revenue equation, r at n equals eight n. Okay, so I'm looking at their point of intersection, which is up here. And you know what, just to make this uh, a little bit prettier, let me change the, uh, <coughs> the scale just a little bit. So I'll I go from x equals negative 10 to, I don't know, about 80. Nah, let's do 90. And then we're, uh, our y scale, it's actually probably not too far off. So you can go negative 50 to 550 and verify that, yeah, okay, we should maybe go a little bit higher. And we'll step by 100s, would be a little bit prettier. Okay, so now that we've properly represented our graph and we've kind of zoomed in on the, the numbers that matter, we get our point of intersection here, which is 66.6 uh, .6 repeating and 533.3 repeating. So what does that number actually represent? What do those numbers represent? So the point of intersection, I'm just going to write this over on my other sheet here. I'm going to round that off to 66.7 and 533.3. And I'll remind you again, the x-axis, the first value, is the n. Uh, what does n represent? It's the number of shirts. And that means that the second, the y value in this case, is c or r but it's the money. Technically, it's different one on each of them. It's the cost and the revenue. And so what is this saying where they intersect each other? Well, I think it's saying that the intersection is where the cost and the revenue are equal. And the cost and the revenue are equal means that the amount that they've spent is equal to the exact same amount that they've brought in. So basically, it's how many shirts would they have to make to hit the breaking even point. So that's the graph and its representation. I've put that over here. Now you'll notice that for the break even point, I have actually rounded up and that's because they can't sell 533.3 repeating shirts. Um, oh, sorry, I put the wrong number there. The number of shirts is the first value, the 66.7. So we'll say that it's uh, 67 shirts that they have to sell in order to break even. Uh, the reason they have to do that is because if they sell 66, they don't break even and they can't sell 66.7. So we're gonna round up a little bit. But essentially it's saying that if they uh, make and sell 67 shirts, it will cost them about $533 to make them and make around $533 on the sales, give or take a little bit because of the decimal points. Can we find an equation for the profit function? Well, think about how profit works. Profit is going to be how much you bring in minus how much you spent to, to make it. So it's gonna be revenue at N minus cost at N. And we can write it that way. Now, I do wanna point out that technically, if we write it that way, we could and probably should write uh, this is actually P N R C is technically a function of three variables. Um, we don't think of it that way because we have our R N function and we have our C N function. 
Uh, but if we didn't, and we just saw that equation, we would need to know what n was, we would need to know what r is, and we would need to know what c is. So those are actually the three unknowns. Now, of course, we do know those things, so we can rewrite this function as a function of n and just n. And that's just going to be 8n minus uh, 200 plus 5n which ends up being 8n minus 200 minus 5n, or 3n minus 200. Now, before we move on, I just want you to actually think about what that equation is saying. It's saying that our profit is $3 a shirt minus 200 bucks, which makes sense. If you're buying for five and selling for eight, you're making $3 per shirt, but you also have to pay off that setup fee of $200, so that's coming out of your profits. I know this all seems pretty easy and is really stuff that you probably did actually in grade, possibly as low as grade nine, almost definitely in grade 11. But these are superposition uh, of functions. They, they are a, a combined functions. And because of that, they actually fit nicely into our unit. Of course, we'll get into some more advanced ones, but for now, that's actually not too bad. Under what circumstances will they lose money or make money? Um, well, if their break-even point is 67 shirts, they'll um, they'll lose if they sell uh, 66 shirts or less, and they'll make money if they sell 67 shirts or more. This, of course, is making a few assumptions. The first assumption is that they didn't make a bunch of extra shirts that they didn't sell, because that's going to obviously make it very hard to break even. Um, it also assumes no one stole any money or lost any money or anything like that. But that's not within the context of our question, so I think we can ignore that. I always love when I scroll up and there's nothing left but homework questions, because that means our job here is done. The video is over. Uh, so there is some homework questions there. A couple of them, it says to graph by hand. Those are to kind of do the ones that we did by hand today, where it's nice to see kind of the point by point constructive uh, construction of a, a function. And then the, the others just use Desmos, once you've kind of got a grasp on how that works. Let me know if you've got any problems. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next lesson.